Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. Today, we're going to be looking at Mosiah chapter 29 through Alma 4. When we studied in Mosiah chapters uh, 18 to 24 a few weeks ago, we talked about some of the principles that it pertains to God's kingdoms as found in Mosiah. Well, sometimes you may hear people say, don't talk about religion and don't talk about politics. Well, you know, every week I'm talking about religion, so we might as well throw in some politics too, which really is Mosiah 29. Some wonderful basic principles that if we follow in politics, our political sphere, things go really, really well. It starts off in chapter 29, verse 8, saying, If it were possible that you could always have just men to be your kings, it would be well for you to have a king. For those of us who live in a republic or a democracy or something not in the kingdom, we're like, ah, I don't know that's true. But you think about it. The celestial kingdom is, well, a kingdom. And there's a king there. I would be quite comfortable having Christ as my king. That would be just fine with me. So a couple other things that are taught in Mosiah 29 is that power corrupts people. That seems to be taught as well in Doctrine and Covenants section 121, verse 39. Not all people, but seems our sad experience is quite a few of them. There's a phrase in there that we're to judge the people according to our law. Whenever you're acting, you have laws, and then you base your actions, your judgments, how the government runs, on the laws. And you look at how many times that's repeated in this chapter and the emphasis it places on the law. The better the laws, the closer they are to God's commandments, the better the laws. If the laws are based on wickedness, they're not so good of laws. Not trying to do a total separation of church and state. I think there should be some, but um, if laws are based on righteousness, it works out for the better. It's better that a man should be judged of God than of man. And how do you tell bad law? Well, we'll come to that in Helaman chapter 7, verses 4 and 5, where they're creating laws for their own gain, their own greed, for their own purposes. Uh, it's common for the majority of the people to decide that which is right. That's most of the time, most of the nations, most of the people. And when we get into a lot of troubles, when the majority chooses not to do what's right or want what's right, there needs to be checks and balances in government. And there needs to be able to have the, the ability of every man and woman to enjoy their rights and privileges, but also their responsibility. Those cannot be divorced from each other. You can't enjoy rights and responsibilities without what rights and privileges without responsibilities. In the Book of Mormon, as it says, every man might bear his part. I love where I am, the form of government, but I love Winston Churchill's quote on democracy. He said, It has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all the others that have been tried. I found that to be true. Um, with the exception of one day when we're in a kingdom of God. Now we come to the end of, chapter of uh, Mosiah. At the end of a book like Mosiah, it's a great time to have a little reflection, to think back on what you've learned. It would be great just to pause and take a few minutes. What did you underline as you were reading the Book of Mormon? What did you write in your margins that impressed you? What did the Spirit teach you that maybe you made a notation or wrote in your study journal? What did you learn that made a difference in your life? I'm a believer that the palest of ink is better than the best of memory. You could consider writing a summary of what you've learned in the book of Mosiah. You could include how, when you felt the Spirit the strongest, what did you learn that brought you closest to Christ? When you write your ideas, the thoughts in your mind crystallize. Crystallizing your thoughts through writing is a great way to reflect, to be able to better understand, and to deepen your understanding of what you've learned, particularly in a great book like Mosiah. But we're going to move on to Alma. <clears throat> in an Alma really is the longest book in the Book of Mormon, but only contains about 39 years worth of history. 91 B.C., to about 52 BC. It's not very long, and it has a theme that runs through it for the entire 39 year period. The theme is really well said by Paul. 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Alma, will say it this way, Alma 31, the word had a more powerful effect upon the people than the sword. Because really the preaching of the word has a great tendency to lead the people to do that which is just. So the word of God is a theme in the book of Alma. The first 16 chapters deal with using the word of God to correct and to teach. Chapters 17 to 28, the four sons of Mosiah use the word of God to be able to convert thousands in their missionary efforts. Chapters 29 and 30, <clears throat> the word of God is used to take on an antichrist. 31 to 35, there's a great experiment on the word. 36 to 42, there's a lot of counsel and correction given to sons by a father. And in 43 to 63, righteousness of individuals grow after being taught the word of God, even in difficult times of war. It's a great theme. Just watch for that through the entire book of Alma. And in Alma, the first one we get to, first character, is Nehor. He has certain doctrines. His first doctrine is that he bears down against the church. He's actively against and persecutes the church. He believes the clergies, like priests, <clears throat> teachers, ought to become popular. Wow. Support. Uh, uh, the clergy should be supported as well. There's no need to fear God, because all will be saved. That's the doctrine of the Nehors. Be popular. Be rich. Don't worry about things, because you're saved in the end. He is a believer of priestcraft. Uh, President Oaks has said, Priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for light into the world, that they may get gain and praise the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. The effects of priestcraft are seen in 2 Nephi 2632. The Book of Mormon applies this principle to those who seem to be serving the Lord, but do so with a hidden motive to gain personal advantage rather than to further the work of the Lord. Priestcraft so that men preach and set themselves for a light unto the world, that they may gain, get gain and the praise of the world. But they seek not the welfare of Zion. Priestcraft is the sin of committing by combination of good act, such as preaching or teaching the gospel, and a bad motive. The act may be good and visible. But the sin is in the motive. On earth the wrong motive may only be known to the actor, but in heaven it is always known to God. During my lifetime I have seen more than a few persons in positions of responsibility in various churches whose activities in the work of the Lord seemed to be motivated predominantly by personal interest. The commandment to avoid priestcraft is a vital challenge to religious persons in every age of time. And Robert Millet made this wise comment. I cannot speak for anyone else, but I believe if I have begun to attract people to myself rather than to the Lord, that I need to undergo some serious introspection. My colleague Joseph McConkie observed to this group some years ago, sometimes we get in our own way. We block the light because we are standing center stage when we should be stepping to the side and just let the message speak for itself. We cause what I call a spiritual eclipse. If I am driven more by ego than by desire to lead the people of people to Christ, if my desires to acclaim are greater than my desires to love and serve the Lord and his children, then my eye is not single to the glory of God, and I will obstruct the light that might have been seen as felt. If, on the other hand, I am humbled to be in the presence of my students, sobered by the sacred assignment to instruct them, and fully cognizant of and willing to trust in him who is the real teacher and converter then, I will have the privilege of witnessing miracles, men and women coming unto Christ, and being perfected in him. For Nehor, he comes up against Gideon. Gideon is now an old-timer who is faithful and has been. Nehor kills Gideon. As a result, Gideon suffers, and I just love the phrase, an ignominious death in Alma chapter 1, verse 15. I add a little side note. Because here it seems that there is a capital punishment that occurs. The church has published the following statement, official statement on capital punishment. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints regards the question of whether, of whether and in what circumstances the state should impose capital punishment as a matter to be decided solely by the prescribed process of civil law. We neither promote nor oppose 
capital punishment. Now, in chapter 1, there is a persecution of the members in Alma. Uh, in Alma 1. So, at verse 19, they start to get persecuted. In verse 20, they're afflicted. I, I love the phrase, with all manner of words. That's the way it starts. A lot of words. And then, because of their humility, they're not fighting back. I think that, well, it now starts to come a little bit more than just words. They contend warmly, in verse 22, even unto blows. And it was the cause of much affliction to the church. It was the cause of much trial with the church. The hearts of many were hardened. And I believe this is part of talking about members of the church, because there, when their hearts were hardened, their names were blotted out. But also, because of this affliction, this persecution, many withdrew themselves. They couldn't stand having people say bad things about them or the church or maybe about Christ. And now this was a great trial. A great trial to the church. A difficulty for them. I love the responses to this persecution of the church members in Alma. As you read it, you look at the different ways that the church members respond to persecution. Study that. Oh, it's great for our day. How did the way in which they responded affect their ability to enjoy the Lord's blessings? It's not the persecution that allows them to feel the Lord's blessings. It's their response. Even in a time of persecution, you can still feel the joy of the Lord. As President Nelson has said, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of of our lives. The focus must be on Christ. The more we focus on Christ, the more we can feel his joy and his love and feel his peace today. Today, we are engaged in a war in the well for, for the welfare of marriage and the home. In my latest reading of the Book of Mormon, I paid particular attention to the ways the Nephites prepared for their battles against the Lamanites. I know the peop, peop, notice of the people of Lehi, Nephi were aware of the intent of the enemy, and therefore they did prepare to meet them. Elder Bednar continues to say, As I read and I studied, I learned that understanding the intent of the enemy is a key prerequisite to effective preparation. We likewise should consider the intent of our enemy in this latter-day war. So we'll have that also as a little bit of a theme as we go through Alma, the intent of the enemy. So you look in Alma chapter 2, verse 11, What's the intent of the Amlicites wanting to distinguish themselves from the Nephites? Well, what do they first want? They want a name. The next chapter, what do they do to distinguish themselves from the Nephites on the field of battle? Well, they mark themselves. They set a mark upon themselves in verse 13. Today, people might want to distinguish themselves from the righteous through an outward appearance. The strength of the youth has a great quote where it says, Through your dress and appearance, you can show that you're, you know how precious your body is. You can show that you are a dis disciple of Jesus Christ and that you love him. Elder Ballard has noted, There is an entire subculture that celebrates contemporary gangs and their criminal conduct with music, clothing styles, language, attitudes, and behaviors. I do not believe that you can stand for truth and right while wearing anything that is unbecoming, one who holds the priesthood of God. To me, it is impossible to maintain the Spirit of the Lord while listening to music or watching movies or videos that celebrate evil thoughts and use vulgar language. In a class setting, I may spend a little bit of time talking about our outward appearance and how it reflects that we are a disciple of Jesus Christ. I really won't get into anything negative or judgmental, but I'll spend more time on this next part with a comparing and a contrasting. You look at how they mark themselves, and now look at the way, I want to say marking in the way, the disciples of Christ mark themselves. For the Amalicites, they mark themselves externally. For the disciples of Christ, their markings are very similar but internalized. So, Mosiah chapter 1 verse 11 Moreover, I'll give this people, says King Benjamin, a name that they may be distinguished 
above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. And this I do, because they have been diligent people in keeping the commandments of God. 23, verse 16, now we're in the later. Now it came to pass, the king and those who were converted were desirous that they might have a name, that they might be distinguished from their brethren. They want to be known as a believer by a name. And moving to chapter 27, verse 27, it tells a little bit more how they are distinguished. And they were among the people of Nephi, and also numbered among them, who were of the church of God. And they are also distinguished, first, for their zeal towards God. Second, their zeal towards men. Third, they are distinguished because they are perfectly honest. Fourth, they were upright in all things. Five, they are firm in the face of Christ. They want to be distinguished by a name, but they also want to be distinguished by their actions. Not just today, not just while they're feeling, you know, like right after the effects of being converted and on a spiritual high, but unto the end. It is wonderful in a class or a family setting to stop and say, all right, who do you know that's distinguished that way by their actions? You get some great comments. In a seminary class, there are some times where a student will just raise their hand and go, my mom. Or they'll say, my dad, and I wish, oh, I wish mom or dad were here. I wish they could hear that because of the high just of regard that the kids have for their parents. I have found that President Benson's words are just as true today. The war Lord works from the outs inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would take people out of the slums. Christ would take the slums out of the people. And then they would take themselves out of the slums. The world would no more would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men, who then change their environment. The world would shape human behavior, but Christ can change human nature. How does a person mark themselves as a follower of Christ today? I mean, if you go down the street, can you mark somebody by their, the way they're distinguished, the way they act? I don't know that dress always does it, because there are some people who are very wicked inside who are dressed really nice outside. But by their fruits you shall know them. And there's one other thing I just want to add, because there's a problem to focus on. The problem is, in Alma chapter 4, that sweet righteousness of the saints has turned and the wickedness of the church is now a great stumbling block to those who did not belong to the church. Because of what church members do, their attitudes, their behaviors, the church begins to fail in its progress. Now you think, okay, what's the solution? Well, this one's pretty obvious because you got to go back to where we talked about at the beginning. What's the great theme or one of the great themes of the book of Alma? Well, it's simple. It's the power of the Word of God. Preach the Word of God, seeing no way that he might reclaim them, save we're bearing down a pure testimony against them. There is power in the Word of God. So a couple ideas as you teach this. Just the principle, I think, is great to be taught most of the time. Most of the people want to do what's right. You can crystallize your thoughts through reflection. You can teach, testify, and apply the power of the Word of God into your life and to the lives of those who you teach. Let Christ have the center stage uh, as you teach and keep your focus on Him. How will you or will you continue to mark yourselves as a follower of Christ this next week? I hope that in your actions that you are distinguished as one who is a follower of Christ. Never forget the power that is in the Word of God. Thanks for spending some time with me. I hope you have a great day and keep smiling.